Welcome to Grace at the Fray, a podcast that explores the many dimensions of God's grace that we find at the frayed edges of life. Come explore how God's grace works to renew your life and send you on mission in His kingdom. Hello, beloved, and welcome to episode 10 of Grace at the Fray, where we explore how God's grace meets us at the frayed edges of life. So my dad is an auto mechanic, and when I was a kid, while there were all sorts of other things that I would have wanted to do with my time, he would frequently ask me to help out fixing a car or a big semi-truck or something like that. And you know what that means for a kid, right? It means hold this flashlight. (laughs) And you might have seen those auto lamps. It's the one with the handle and the light bulb with a cage uh, around the bulb and a hook over the top of it so that the mechanic can hang the light under the hood anywhere that they, they want it to be, right? But instead of hanging the light exactly where he wanted it, my dad would have me hold it. And I could have been playing video games or riding my bike outside or any number of things that I wanted to do, uh, but he wanted me to learn how to fix cars. Did he need me? No. Was I actually helping? (laughs) Well, you know, actually, that's kind of not even the point, is it? My dad was teaching me something, and it was more than... It was actually more than just how to fix a vehicle. He was teaching me how to get outside of myself. Just like any other, sh- uh, any other chore, it's about showing up and being ready to help. So the last episode of the podcast, in my interview with Emily Schrader, we talked about the remarkable impact of just showing up. The Lord can do a lot more than we realize if we would just show up. So this week, I want to share with you an interview that I had with a couple that I, that that learned how the Lord can do amazing things if you would just show up, ready to serve folks. Think about it this way. There is no such thing as an insignificant task when it is done with a servant's heart. So let me take you back to London where I was in December, where I sat down with Jeremy and Angel to talk about how learning to serve the local ministry leaders when they lived in Uganda has prepared them for servant leadership in London. And here, here's a passage of scripture that I want to be resonating in your heart during this conversation. It's from, from Mark 9. It's where the disciples had been arguing about who was the most awesome. And when they walk in the house, uh, Jesus asked them what, what they've been talking about. And, and there's this amazing awkward silence because they know that they've been dumb. And, and then Jesus sits his disciples down and he says this, Whoever wants to become first must become last of all and servant of all. Jesus is offering a story of what it looks like to die to your own agenda in order to become the servant of all. And Jeremy and Angel's story testifies to the beauty and joy of following their Savior into humble uh, places that need Jesus' salvation. So I want you to listen for the, the way that they have an open-handedness hand, for, uh, for the way that God guides them and directs them. And I want you to have this question wiggle its way into your heart. How can I become the last of all, the servant of all? We are Jeremy and Angel, and we are not alone. We have our three daughters, Riley, Genevieve, and Caroline. We are in South Hall, London, the West Community or West Side community of South Hall. It is a series of the Lord leading us that brought us here. Yeah. So start from the beginning because mm-hmm. you you were in Uganda for a, a long time. Yeah. And I want to hear. I'm really curious about like what life was like in Uganda for the two of you, what life was like with your family, uh, but also the nature of the ministry mm-hmm. over there, uh, specifically what Mercy Ministry looked like, and your heart for the ministry uh, over there. So who fell in love with Uganda first? Uh, that would be, well, hmm. I didn't even know where Uganda was on a map. 
<laughs> I didn't realize it was in Africa when it was first mentioned to me. So Uganda was not on my radar at all. Yeah, we, we entered that conversation <laughs> thinking that Central America is where the Lord was leading us. And that opportunity did not come to fruition. And so um, Uganda was suggested to us, and we went on a site visit mm. and immediately just... The Lord broke our heart. Yeah, we fell in love uh, right away with just the people, the country, mm-hmm. and their married. need for Jesus. Yeah. Yes. We, yeah, yeah. yeah. We had been married for 12, 13 years oh, when okay. this, this point came. So the, we, we felt the Lord calling us out of uh, careers that, that we both loved to a, a life of cross-cultural service. Um, and so we went on a site visit, and it is... It lives up to its moniker of being the Pearl of Africa. Mm-hmm. It is a place of immense physical beauty, but that is dwarfed by a people that are immensely beautiful and welcoming. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we uh, we still have a deep love uh, for Uganda and Ugandans, but it was a, a place that we really enjoyed being. It was difficult in many ways, and it was very difficult to leave, but, but we are grateful that the Lord led us there and, and used us while we were there. Yeah, we w- initially went over to work with some form of a short-term missions, inviting people into Uganda, into Africa, so that they would fall in love and then hopefully move across the continent. And then that didn't happen for a few different reasons. And we got connected with the refugee ministry up in the north part of the country. And so we were um, introduced to the South Sudanese refugees that were living in the in the country at the time. And our heart just broke for this people group. We had no experience with refugees or refugee mm-hmm. ministry, what that meant. Mm-hmm. Um, but just, you know... <laughs> through God's calling, just put us there at a time where they were really in need and working with the local pastors that were in the refugee camps that fled with their people and they had their churches in these camps with nothing and they just needed help with resources. And that was something that we would pray about, talk to people about. And it was really exciting because they would call and be like, we need money for a new water pump. And we're like, oh, well, there's no water, wa- no, there's no money in the account. So let's pray about it and see what happens. And money would ching, mm-hmm. you know, end yeah, up in this like magic account. Talk, that's what you're talking about. Money yeah. just here is money. Yeah, and it, God provides. Mm-hmm. It, it wasn't anything that we did. It, you know, it was just, you know, their their belief and their faith and prayer and God would provide. And so it was an interesting ministry of just connections and learning and God providing his resources and his ways. Mm-hmm. Um, say more about say more about how the Ugandans the urgency mm-hmm. of Ugandans teaching you to pray because mm-hmm. yesterday when I was hanging out with Rosemary, we were talking about how Surge was founded mm-hmm. on the prayers of the Ugandan church, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, so talk to me about what the, what did the Ugandans mm-hmm. teach you about prayer? Mm-hmm. You could pray anytime, anywhere for anything. Like, you, driving was very dangerous. It was the most dangerous thing of any of being in the country was either driving or being on a motorbike. Like being on the road. Yeah. Just being on the road was dangerous. Walking, yeah. bicycling, car. And so That's you like would... me here. <laughs> yeah, here it's kind of scary, not too. Way. <laughs> Well, I don't know which way the traffic is coming. Anyway, keep going. <laughs> and so you would get in a car, and before you went anywhere, you know, at the beginning, we always had a driver or someone to take us and show us around. And, and he'd be like, okay, let's pray. And so it was just one of those things, like as an American, maybe we would pray before a long car journey yeah. or like if, you know, we live in Florida, so there's not snow or anything like that. But Every time you got in the car, you prayed. So there's just that urgency and that God will protect us. God will provide. That's who, where we need to go first to yeah. Him. Rosemary talked about God puts us in places of dependence. Mm. Desperation. Desperation, desperation is what she, he, he puts us in places of desperation that cause us to prayer, to pray, and that just makes us constantly dependent on Him. You know, so if it's dangerous roads, it's dangerous roads. Oh, yeah. I think there, too, was a, uh, something that the Ugandans and the South Sudanese uh, both modeled to us was a an expectation of an answer. Hmm. So, you know, the, the prayers were offered out of a 
uh, trust that the Lord was going to answer the prayers. And so, um, you know, I think there was a, an expectation that you would get a favorable answer. But there was still an expectation that God is going to answer us because yeah. we're talking to God. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, really any aspect of life in need would be prayed for. And that was something that was convicting to me because, you know, you know it's, what can I do first to try to resolve this before I ask the Lord uh, to step right. in? Or to provide the answer, or to provide what's needed. Um, mm. So that was something I was very taken with with their prayer life. So what would they do? They expect an answer. What was what? What would they do when the answer was no? Well, I think uh, where where this was really modeled for us is with the South Sudanese pastors we worked with in the camp. So the 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 group of pastors that we served would provide for us a prioritize list of the greatest needs that they saw as uh, the church in this community that needed to be met and they didn't have the resources to meet it and so they would come to us and ask uh, if if we could help provide this this funding and we would tell them you know James Abraham we 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 don't have the money in our account right now but we we will ask we will pray and over the course of the time that there was instances where you know the money didn't come, and there, there was never any anger or any doubt of the Lord's care for them or love for them. There was a a hopeful dependence that the Lord would provide later, or in a different way. And then there was times they would ask for things, and the Lord in His gracious abundance would provide more than we asked for. And so at that point. I was I was also taken with that heart for wanting to offer praise and thanks to the Lord for giving us things in response. Yeah. yeah, I think for for my my faith journey and my and the the sanctifying work that the Spirit did, has done in me, a lot of that was through the South Sudanese Christians and how they responded to the Lord. Mm-hmm. And so I'm grateful for that. I really mm-hmm. am. Yeah, I think hopeful waiting, you know, a lot of the, especially Ugandan ladies, you know, to be a real woman, you would need to be married and have children and not only have children, but provide sons as heirs. And, and so even with the Christian, the Christian women, you know, that that was a part of their culture that was really, they struggled with. And so praying for a woman to find a husband and a good Christian husband, especially for the Christian women. And then once it was the marriage, it was praying for children and and hopefully boys, or if they had daughters, they needed a son or wanted a son. And, and so there was a lot of prayer around that with the, especially the women in Uganda and just meeting them there. But it was, it was usually a hopeful waiting that it would happen. Mm-hmm. They just knew that God's timing right. was what they which were waiting a, on. Which is a profound demonstration of faith. When the Lord says no, immediately it turns me into it. I'll, I'll, mm-hmm. I'll just kind of plummet into some sort of tailspin of, of doubt or despair or spiritually speaking, flopping on the floor with a temper tantrum or whatever. Um, because... Because it, it it becomes confusing, like, mm-hmm. am I doing something wrong? Mm-hmm. You know, like, my attitude reflects what I think God is like. I kind of expect God to be this hard task driver. You know, like my knee-jerk reaction. So the knee-jerk reaction of the folks that are teaching you how to pray is, okay, well, you're still my king, mm-hmm. and so I'm, I'll wait for you. Where else am I going to go? Mm-hmm. You know, and that's... The, the humility of that posture is, I don't know, what did that do? What did that do in you guys? Well, it's beautiful. I mean, I yeah. Y'all, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just beautiful and it's heartwarming and encouraging. And yeah. and yeah, it just puts that mirror up because when I hear no, it turns into my self-centered focus right. sin of, oh, I didn't do it well enough or I'm not good enough or I didn't pray hard enough or my belief is not enough. But me, 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 me. Yeah, it's all yeah, about yeah, me. Yeah. But when you're in that hopeful, hopeful waiting, you know, it's like God will provide. Yeah. It's all about Him. So it's that keeping that focus 
on him, not on myself. I had the opportunity to attend a conference in Chigali, Rwanda, while we were there. And over breakfast one morning, I, I met a Kenyan uh, bishop uh, named Dennis Tongoy. And he, he shared something with me over breakfast that's really stuck with me. And it, and it, uh, it was something I'm, I, I'm very grateful that he shared because it opened my eyes to the difference of image bearers around the world. He asked a question. He says, Jeremy, do you know the difference between Americans and Africans? And I thought he was setting me up for a joke because okay. he was smiling at me when he asked. <laughs> but, but I, How many Americans does oh, it take to change your life? Yeah, but I was like, no, Dennis, I don't. And he goes... Uh, Americans speak operationally. Africans speak aspirationally. Huh. And so, you know, I chewed on it for a minute, and I was like, Dennis, can you can you explain that? And he says, Well, what what you speak flows from your heart. So he says, if if I was to ask you how you are going to journey from Chigali, Rwanda to Mombasa, Kenya, you would probably provide a list of things that have to happen, of timetables that have to be met so that the operation of getting you from point A to point B would, would be, be met. Mm. He said, if, if you were to speak to any one of these East Africans here and say, how are you going to get from Chigali to Rwanda? It, it would not be about the operations. It would be, uh, we'll get there. I'll go talk to this person. And, you know, it may take five times as long, but there's a, there's a, a hope and that aspiration, a, a, a trust that I will make it from Chigali to Mombasa. But, I don't know how it's going to happen, but I trust that it'll happen. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, where that statement really impacted me was on the difference of peoples. So where the, the, the East Africans that we lived amongst were very relational people, there was a beauty to that, that there was more importance on maintaining relationships, on honoring the people that you meet in the path of doing what you're doing. And so the objective may get completely slowed down. You know, whatever task that, that you ask this person to do may take a week to get done when it should have only taken four or five hours. Mm -hmm. But the honoring that's given to people is, is really put on importance. Yeah. All those combinations of factors, the, the, the way that, Ugandans and South Sudanese and Kenyans that we met. There was a reliance and a hope on the the aspirational goodness of the Lord. Mm. The importance of maintaining relationships with people was more important than getting something done. Yeah. And so that time in Uganda, you know, in many ways, spiritually, emotionally, culturally was huge for us because it just really opened our eyes to the beauty of image bearers around the world and how they reveal a character of God that is different from how a different people group will, will reveal a yeah. different character of the Lord. Yeah. Your so, bandwidth for, for experiencing mm -hmm. the glory of humanity, the mm -hmm. glory of what it means to be brought into Jesus, the true human, yeah. This this glorious thing of what Jesus has done to make mm -hmm. us human, you you go, oh, you mean like that? Mm -hmm. You know, it's 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 more than just, you know. There's the fr there's the saying. It's not about the destination; it's about the journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're and, and when you started telling that story, I was like, oh yeah, it's like mm -hmm. not about the destination; it's the journey. And it's like, well, no. By the end of that story, I thought, no, it's about the people mm -hmm. along the journey. Mm -hmm. And honoring those people and putting yourself in a position to pause for a moment to really share in the human experience. Mm -hmm. I really loved how, I don't know if we recorded it off camera, you said, we wanted to serve under national leaders mm -hmm. uh, and talk about that and how it relates to mercy ministry. What, what the Ugandans taught you about how to see a human, it's, it's not strategy. It's, mm -hmm. no, I really do value their opinion. I really do want to see what it's like to serve them and what they need. So tell me tell me more about what that looks like. There is a an intimacy, uh, a, a level of understanding that 
a people group has for themselves that somebody from the outside doesn't really understand. You know, you could fill a bookcase up with books and read through them about all the cultural nuances of a people groups. And you, you'll never be able to get, you'll never really be able to get it. And one of the things that when we went into the refugee settlement is that um, there was a stark reality that we didn't know what we were walking into. Mm. There was multiple tribes of South Sudanese that were on different sides of a conflict from different religious backgrounds. I mean, maybe all Christian, but from different flavors of Christianity. There was experiences that they had that were so vital to understanding who they were that my my new new air presbyterian pastor friend could look at you know look at a person and says okay they're 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 a, they're a mororo they're they're a dinka just by seeing them huh. and he would understand that okay now there's going to be th- th- there's this component to understanding them that you need to know to walk in to to this conversation so for me, I have a love for these people that we're living amongst, a passion to understand them. But I'm entering on, you know, a hundred steps far, farther back than, than my friend James or Abraham would be entering into this, mm-hmm. this conversation. So I may be able to, to physically love, to, to, to show compassion, to, to share the gospel message, but I'm sharing it almost in a different language. We may be both doing it in English, right, right. but the, the, the nuances of, of how this person is going to receive this message is, um, is going to be impacted by how you understand how they hear you. In language, I'm not talking about language, it's the heart. You know? And so um, in the settlement where we served, we were the only Westerners that came in there on a regular basis. The police told us this, there were the guards, the... You know, we, we were sort of affectionately joked, you know, you're our Americans. Uh-huh. Uh, you're the white, the whites the are token, here. The token. And, and I, it wasn't, I never felt that any way other, any way other than an honoring way, because we were coming to them. We were visiting them, mm-hmm. that, that gospel ministry of visitation, uh-huh. the hospitality. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I was very aware of is that this honor wanted to be given to Angel, to me, to our friends that would come with us at that time. But it was, uh, we wanted to make sure that that they, that the, 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 the community at large knew that we were here in partnership with the men that have sacrificially served you, the women that have sacrificially mm-hmm. served you from day one. And so we, we would always try to serve underneath these these leaders that had a a sun up to sundown passion for their neighbors mm. and the gospel was going forth in these camps these men and women were were, were sharing the gospel with their neighbor they the gospel the gospel was reconciling enemies to each other mm. right think as new heirs different side of this this travel conflict that the Dinkas were wanting to build houses for the New Air widows. The, the New Air churches wanted to build houses for the Dinka widows and orphans. Um, and so we saw really quickly that the church being built and going forth was not dependent on us. Christ was building his church mm-hmm. through his people. And so how, how were we being equipped to serve? And that was where we could use the diaconal love that we have to pour into these church leaders to to serve them to help equip them to provide the needs physical needs that they had so that they could then turn around and hand it off to someone else right Mm -hmm. Uh, so that was real important for us to see that the national leadership was who the lord was putting there on the end of our time there when after a lot of crying and praying and conversations and discussions and dragging of feet and uh, trying to figure out how we could how we could stay in this camp when we, when we felt pretty clearly that the Lord was was telling us it was time to go mm-hmm. I went to the settlement and I don't think you you weren't with me on this trip I drove up 
and had a meeting with the leaders. And we were in this little room, smaller than this. And the South Sudanese are very stoic people. Stoic in the sense of um, they're very exuberant in their excitement, but you don't see a lot of the, uh, especially with the men, a lot of the, 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 the crying or sad emotions. And so I was sitting with these, these men telling them that, um, that Angel and I had made the decision that, that our family was going to be leaving Uganda. And I started crying. Are you a crier? Uh, I am a crier. I love it. There's been like three uh, times. Uh, little bit. Uh, I'm a crier. This time. Well, I started crying with these, 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 these men as I was telling them that, you know, that we felt the Lord was leading us out. And, and what happened next was these men started crying that it sort of shocked me, you know, seeing, seeing these men that, uh, our Ugandan friends would always sort of stereotype South Sudanese as, you know, they're, they're very, Stoic. they're very tough people. They're the warriors. They're the hard they're people. Hard. <laughs> I mean, meaning that, you know, they carry spears around and they're, they're hard people. But, and they're a foot taller than everybody too. So that, um, that can be intimidating yeah. sometimes. <laughs> they're sitting in this room with these men that are starting to cry and come up and embrace me and hug me. And that was very impactful. But then James, um, James Bab Manuel, my Presbyterian pastor friend, said, Jeremy, the gospel was here before you arrived. The gospel's here after you leave. The church is growing. Go forth with our love and appreciation. And, you know, and, and he released us. Yeah. They released us. And that was, that was really impactful to me because that gave us a comfort to, even though we're grieving, we're still grieving. We still miss them. It was a comfort in going that the ministry of Christ was not stopping. His kingdom is still advancing, whether we're there or not. Mm-hmm. And that's the impact of coming in to serve national leadership, that they're there. This is their home. These are their people. These are this is their passion. And if we can come and serve and equip and benefit their ministries for a season, that's that's a blessing. Yeah. Blessing mm-hmm. to us and I'm hopefully it's a blessing to the church mm-hmm. that's there. But there is something beautiful about just kind of showing up at a place and having this this a posture of uh I I'm not here to be amazing. I'm not here mm-hmm. to save anybody, you know, to be a savior. Mm-hmm. I'm not here to tell anybody what to do. I, I just want to be with you people and help out if I, if I can. But then the response is, so if someone came into my life and said that, you know, I'd be like, thanks. I'm good. <laughs> Got it pretty much taken <laughs> care of, which can feel true. You know, like that's my authentic experience, right? You know, mm-hmm. but it's not true. Mm-hmm. It's not true. Uh, so to be honest and say, oh, you want to be in my life and like be you with me? Well, it requires a certain amount of humility uh, to show that kind of hospitality. So mm-hmm. the, the, what makes that story beautiful to me is the mutuality in the relationship where they said, yes, come. Um, and you said, tell me what to do. And mm-hmm. they'll say, we will tell you what to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell me how to love you. We will tell you how to love. Uh, and then it just became this mutual relationship of, mm-hmm. of mutual edification. And so then everybody leaves a little bit more humble, a little bit more dependent, a little bit more full of joy. You know? And it's those tears of joy. You know, when, when your pastor releases you, mm-hmm. uh, it's tears of joy. Mm. And and I will always miss Uganda is going to be a thing somewhere mm-hmm. in your gut forever. Yeah. You know, you will always love Ugandans forever. You know. So one last question, Angel, uh, off camera. I said, hey, tell me, tell me what it means to you that when the gospel renews you, that the kingdom of God quickens your spirit that that leads to mission. And mm. you and you were like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, tell me what that means. <laughs> well, leaving, yeah, leaving Uganda was hard for both of us, for our family. Um, but it, it was a clear 
yeah, after like Jeremy said, a lot of praying, a lot of crying, a lot of conversations. We knew that's what God was moving us to do. And so, but I came home like, what is missions? What is this real? Should we, you know, the, the big question, should we just send money? Should we go and be in person? You know, is this worth the suffering and the heartache and are taking your family with you and, and having them suffer with you? And so all these questions and really just, um, I would sit in church on Sundays and one Sunday I'd be like, oh yeah, we should go, we should go back. And then the next Sunday I'd be like, no, we're no, like that's, yeah, we're crazy. Like Jeremy would be like, are we just crazy? Is this, <laughs> is this crazy? Um, we had so many questions and through a lot of prayer, through a lot of wise counsel, through some very good counseling, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, God really just showed us both in very different ways that we weren't crazy um, and and that God has called us, created us, changed our heart. You know, you can kind of pick what what feels right, but, you know, God has created us as a married couple and I think as a family to live cross-culturally mm -hmm. and and serve people outside of America so whatever that definition is of missions and, and part of that we went on a vision trip with Surge to Prague and to look at their teams there and what they were doing and they were uh, working with refugees and uh, we had a heart for refugees and and knew nothing about Prague. Prague was all new to us. And through the time there, we realized, well, God hasn't called us to Prague. This isn't for us. Prague, you know, the, the team at the time needed needed something different. And very we, specific needs. Very yeah. specific they, they needs. Could we could not yeah. meet them. That was not us. <clears throat> well, I just love that, that immediately <laughs> you were like, oh, we can't do that. Versus... Yeah. We could force this. No. Yeah, yeah. It, it was a clear, <clears throat> closed door. But for me, God really showed me that missions is a thing. God has called us to it. Um, he's called people to stay and give, and he's called people to go and do and be. And that was really something that was just beautiful. Like I came back from that church, that trip, and I'm like, Surge isn't the place for us, but let me tell you what's going so on. Prague, or, sorry, Prague, Prague, Prague isn't the place for us, <laughs> but let me tell you what's yeah. going on. And just seeing his people, um, not only the Surge team members, but also the locals that were there and partnering yeah. and yeah. It just it lit me on fire again for yeah. missions, and so that was really exciting. Yeah, coming back from a vision trip with a no, but it was a we were still excited mm -hmm. that um, I, that was definitely work that the Lord had done in our hearts over the oh, about a, I don't know about a year or so between Uganda and then we went on that trip. That uh, in a year prior, it probably would have been a really hard. No, even though it was a good no, it would have been a hard no to get. Mm. Um, and, you know, I think that no both was good for us, but it was good for the teams that were there, too, because I think they, they realized, hmm, yeah, you guys aren't the fit, and we didn't really understand what we really needed, but now, now, we, we, now we know. And so I think it was good for everybody, and and I pray it was good for the, <laughs> the, 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 the work of Christ's kingdom there because— of us coming to visit. And so, um, yeah, it, it's a crazy journey that's, that's led us here to London, but, uh, you know, the Lord's been good to us all through it. Mm -hmm. One of the first Sundays when we came back from Uganda, we walk into, well, our sending church closed while we were in Uganda oh, no. in Orlando. Okay. Uh, when we were, were deciding where are we going to go back to, um, we had sold our home, right. left our what careers, uh, yeah. We didn't have a house to go back to in Orlando, and then now we didn't have a church. And so the church I grew up with in Birmingham, Altadena Valley, they, they pursued us. So we want you back here. Hmm. And we come into church, and that first Sunday, uh, one of the songs that is one of our favorites music makes us cry was, you know, "Good Father, You're a Good Good Father," and the way that. Uh, out the he performs it, it it's it's or, or, or helps lead the church in singing it is that it's usually a, a quiet 
one and there's a, there's a part where just the musicians drop out and it's just that the church singing and it's and it's almost just this time of restful conversation where you're saying you, know, you are a good father and I'm love that's who I am mm-hmm. and that I remember just bawling <laughs> at that point I think Angel was bawling we, we were and I think people were looking around at us like what's going on but all through this journey that we've been on that we've been constantly reminded that yeah we do have a good father yeah and that that first Peter passage, you know, where we, we we have an inheritance that's kept, and we're being kept. But in that meantime, there are trials and sufferings that we walk through, but for a purpose. You know, it's refining our faith. It's it's purifying us, but it's bringing glory to the Lord. But we are held secure. Yeah. And and so we were beat up coming out of mm-hmm. Uganda. We had a lot of we were tired. Yeah. We were tired, mm-hmm. but. We were kept secure even in the midst of that. And so a lot of those bruises and, and the hardships and struggles we had, I think, have sort of made us who we are now. That here in South Hall, when we've had hard things that's happened, <laughs> we can look back and say, you know, we were kept yeah. even in the midst mm-hmm. of hard things because we have a good father that loves us. Yeah. And so we're... Yeah, you have an aspirational mm. hope. We do. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I love this dance between I have a father who loves me. Mm. And then the father says, go play in my kingdom. Mm. Go to Uganda mm. and go and my kingdom is there. And go play, which i.e. go serve. Mm. Uh, go love someone besides yourself. You know, and, and so Jesus frees us to love someone besides ourselves, and then we go and then we get beat up and so then you just kind of find yourself tail between your legs you go back to a good good father mm-hmm. who loves you and mm-hmm. says well done was that fun mm. it was other stuff too <laughs> it was hard it was exhausting it was such a trial uh, it was beautiful but yeah thank you for yeah. that yeah. So now what do you want me to do? You know, hmm. after, after you've cr- cr- crawled into the father's arms and experienced the goodness of God for you, he goes, all right, now go, mm-hmm. go again, mm-hmm. go to, go to London. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, um, but that's the dynamic. It is back and forth and that's the Christian life. You know, he yeah. gathers his people in and then he sends them out mm-hmm. and then gather and just like breathing you know, the, the gospel sends us out and then gathers us back in. Mm-hmm. Anyway. anyway, so thanks for, thanks for sharing. <laughs> I, I look forward to hearing more of, of how the story goes uh, mm-hmm. in coming years because mm-hmm. there's so many stories. And it's a never-changing story. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, we know the destination. We, we have the aspiration that we know how it's going to end, but we don't know how the journey is going to go. Along the way, in that journey, uh, yeah, that that that's a beautiful that's a beautiful idea. That yeah, the destination, you know, me, uh, this American boy who mm-hmm. who's like, all right, this is my objective, mm-hmm. you know, it's the destination. And Jesus goes, yeah, except the kingdom of God is now. So find someone that you can love mm-hmm. and learn how to learn how their humanity will make you more like it, uh, mm-hmm. more like me. Yeah. Uh, and the spirit moves and all of that. So, <laughs> can I ask a question? Yeah, because <laughs> you haven't got on to what you're doing here in London. Ah. I, I, I'd love to hear about what you're ah. doing here in Andrew's hometown, in London. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we sort of mentioned it a little bit before. One one of the ways that we feel that the Lord has equipped us to serve in His kingdom is through diaconal ministries. So, I was ordained as a deacon in the PCA Church. I think Angel has very many of those same diaconal giftings. The invitation to come join this team uh, was really based off of and wrapped around this this heart for diaconal ministries. And so, uh, looking at um, you know Scripture, where it's Romans twelve or First Corinthians twelve, it's about these gifts of grace and the, and the way that the Lord has gifted His church to serve. You know, there's those ministries of hospitality and visitation and mercy uh, that 
I think Angel and I have a, an equipping to serve in those ways. And so part of our interview when we came to, to join and we were sharing about, you know, when they when the session of the church and the team leadership here asked us, why, why would you want to come here? Was that we wanted to come in and serve alongside of a diaconate, um, a local diaconate that reflected the beauty of the community we live in, to, to use mercy ministry as a means of word ministry, to pursue people, the outsiders, the refugees, the sojourners that are here that are hurting and are in need for a multitude of ways, but how can we pursue them to, to love them? And when the question is, why are you loving on us? Why are you serving us this way? Then we can say, well, we're, we're loving you because Christ first loved us. Mm-hmm. Let me tell you about Christ mm-hmm. and his love. So we were, we were asked to come uh, here to be a part of our church to help in the, the growth of a, a, a diaconate, a missional diaconate to here as our previous conversation, we don't know how the journey is going to play out. So we arrived December of 19 and COVID comes just a few months later. Lockdown happens. In the midst of the lockdown, um, we have a new church plant that has started just down the road. So part of our team, co-workers, have started this, uh, go to start with this new church plant. And so part of the group that goes that went down there was our former team leaders. Uh, as the church planning pastor and wife. Um, and so we were asked to step into team leadership here. So the, how we are serving is a sort of in that, that sense of flux and changing uh, because we have new responsibilities. Um, part of that is serving our team, our teammates that's here, co-workers that we have here, to, to love on them, to serve them, to help help them be able to go forth and do the ministries they do. So that's taken uh, a big chunk of our time. But this heart for wanting to serve local leadership is still there. And so one of the ways that I've been asked to serve is to to serve our elders in our church. I help them by serving them. I mean, as broad of a term as that could be. Well, I love that you run the soundboard on Sunday. So, yeah, <laughs> I, do that, I do that poorly. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, if that may be giving giving our pastors a day of rest once every couple months. And so by helping uh, bring, for, bring the word during the service, that may be a way. Um, I'm really excited that right now, we this month of December, we're doing officer nominations in the church. So uh, we're, we're really praying that um, there will be a group of people raised up to serve as elders and deacons in our church. That we can, over the next season of time, pour into them to help train, equip, whatever the, 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 the word may be that we can help pour into them, but ultimately so that as they're raised up, we can serve alongside of them, under them, encourage them as they step forward in this ministry that the Lord's called them to as Christians in his kingdom here in West London. Well, I love um, that you have, and it's not, it's not this head knowledge strategy of like, this is the best thing or this is the this is the way that it will work best. Mm-hmm. Um, it's this gut level desire to come in and serve under the local leaders, mm-hmm. um, and it, it's, it's very similar to what was happening in Uganda. You're just doing it in this context, and I loved how in our previous conversation, in our Zoom conversation, you were like, "I don't want to be an elder. <laughs> I want to be a deacon," <laughs> um, and I find that beautifully hum. A humble posture to be very powerful because that posture is what's going to move the leadership mm-hmm. forward uh, where you're like, I don't want to be the leader. I, the Lord has called me not to be the leader. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he and I are, mm-hmm. are in agreement here, mm-hmm. <laughs> finally, or whatever. <laughs> um, wonderfully, joyfully, we're in agreement that I'm here to help uh equip you to be the leader, you know, who you leaders, you local leaders, I want you to be, I want to see the Lord use you because only you can do what needs to be done. 
uh, in the manner that it needs to be done in, yeah, in this place. Mm -hmm. So, in in one of Harvey Kahn's books, uh, Evangelism, he, he talks about these different doors into the same room, and this room being, uh, you know, this community of faith. And like one door is uh, proclamation, evangelism. One door is uh, like teaching. Another one's liturgy, worship. But then another door is diaconos, mm. service. And we know that the Spirit, we believe that the Spirit is the one that goes and breaks that person's hard heart of stone, brings life, regenerates it so that they, they're receptive to whichever form of invitation comes. But that there is a door that is diagnosed service as a way in. In the context we live here with our neighbors, they welcome you in. You're hungry, come be fed. You need a bathroom, a place to shower because you're a rough sleeper, you're homeless, come. Well, you have a bathroom here, you can come and clean up. There's hospitality happening, service happening. And if our neighbors who are delightful people are inviting or serving in the church of Christ, his people are not welcoming and visiting and inviting the same way. We're, we're missing something. We're, we're, not, we're not showing the whole giftings of the spirit and the body that he's put here to do the ministry that the Lord's called us to. So, you know, it may be it may be years down the road before there is a active diaconate of the church here that's doing this. But I, I think this is a, a vision, a, a, a hope, an aspiration mm -hmm. that is one that is worthy to hold to say we want to do word and deed holistically here. We're not going to bifurcate them and split them. We want to do both. We want to invite you, love on you, serve you, and share the good news that goes along with that to you. So that's that's the hope here. COVID put a big... A big, in Ugandan prayer Speed terms, hump. Yeah, just a speed bump. But we're, we're seeing it move forward. Mm -hmm. um, and we're praying. We're praying that the Lord raises up deacons. We're praying the Lord raises up elders, shepherds that you know have a heart for the flock. Uh, but we're trusting in the great shepherd, the 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 the, the great deacon, <laughs> the great elder to oversee us and to equip us and to encourage us as we go forward. Well, I'm going to pray an aspirational prayer. <laughs> That's the word for the day. Mm -hmm. I think. Uh, Jesus, we have. We have hope because we have met you and and whatever the answer to our prayers, as long as we're with you, um, you know that we, we have life, mm -hmm. that there is hope. Uh, so give us great faith uh, for all these things that we aspire for uh, as, we, as we play in the kingdom that you have purchased for us by your death and resurrection. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, help us that this kind of hope would be something real um, every moment uh, of our day. So keep, continue to call us back to those as we're doing these, uh, the, whatever mundane thing we might find ourselves doing, uh, call us back to a magnificent hope. Mm. We pray in your name. Amen. 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 Thanks for hanging out. <laughs> Thank I you. Appreciate it. Thanks for coffee. Thank You're you. Welcome. <laughs> <In time. laughs>consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he, he made himself nothing. He, taking the very nature of a servant, he humbled himself, and he became obedient to death on a cross. 
And that's why he's the greatest. That's why Jesus is the first. Because he became the last. He took the lowest place. If you're going to become the servant of all, it means following Jesus to the lowest place. It means relinquishing, dying to all those things that you've been accumulating in order to build your own greatness. And you can't do this alone. We're in this together, right? And we want to help one another develop that servant's heart that takes the lowest place. So we at Surge, we've compiled some resources that we think will be helpful for you on your journey. The first is uh, the Gospel Center Life Study on the Book of Mark by John Parrott. I'll have a link in the show notes. Uh, and when you get it, I want you to go to straight to page 37, and uh, you're welcome. And when you're ready to, to explore what living out of the lowest place looks like, grab this book. This is the mission-centered life to see what following Jesus into the broken places, the frayed edges of life looks like. This is by Bethany Ferguson. I'll have a link in the show notes for that as well. These resources are meant to be used in community. And one of the most powerful ways that we at Surge build community is through events like the Gospel Center Life Weekend Retreats, a one-on-one -on -one mentor discipleship called Sonship, a discipleship lab cohorts, leadership lab cohorts, and our, our big conferences called Sonship Week. And then that one, that one's a week-long retreat where we explore a lot of ideas like this. Like, you are far worse than you could ever imagine. But Jesus loves you far more than you could have ever dared hope. So, come and die. Man, if you want to know more about what that means, join me and the rest of the Renewal team in Hollywood, Florida, this October. Go to surge.org slash sonshipweek for more information about that. Now, as I close, let me take you back to that flashlight uh, that I was holding as a kid under the hood of a car as my dad was, was fixing it. You know, every time my dad asked me to help fix a car, he was teaching me how to help, how to, how to think outside of myself and serve the needs of others. It was all part of trying to instill in me a servant's heart. But that's not the main thing that was happening. That was actually a byproduct of something more significant. My dad... He just wanted to be with me. In the work that he was doing, he wanted me to participate with him. And I hope that you now see that what we're actually talking about is the reality that your Heavenly Father loves you, and He doesn't need you for His kingdom to come. Rather, it's His joy for you to participate with Him in the things that He is doing. And more often than not, what he's asking you to do, it might just feel like holding a flashlight while your father fixes a broken world. But what do you think it means that you are the light of the world? So today, as the Lord guides you to the places he wants you to serve, as he calls you to take up your cross and follow him, know that his blessing goes with you. That Jesus goes with you. So may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to smile down on you. May the Lord be gracious to you, turn his bright eyes to you, and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, life everlasting. Amen.